Okay, hello and welcome to this uh, Barra Roundtable webinar uh, hosted by Barra and it's been organised to look at robotic machine tending. Uh, now, I'm really excited about the next hour. We've got a great panel um, that are going to be answering questions all related to this topic, stepping into machine tending. Now, uh, there'll be obviously, hopefully, uh, you know, dozens of you watching and listening this and you'll probably will have questions and we can get to those towards the end of the webinar we've got a special session for question and answers uh, but during the webinar the panel of industry professionals will discuss a range of topics about how machine tending is uh, currently being used the trends towards more companies employing robotic systems uh, to automate their kind of dull and dirty and dangerous tasks and how the implementation of these systems was approached by both the system integrators and the end users, which is the fascinating part for me, the fact we've got end users involved in this too. Now we'll also look at why companies invested or companies invested in these systems and also why some companies looked at this technology and decided it was not right for them at this moment. So all that to come over the course of the next hour or so. I'm Paul Jones, the uh, founder and managing director of MTV CNC, and I shall be sharing this uh, entire webinar. So looking forward um, to hearing from our panelists, of which we're going to introduce uh, now. There's a few housekeeping rules that have actually come up on the screen as well. Uh, so if you can just read through those, we will be recording this webinar as well. So. Uh, for those of you that, that need to uh, just have a quick look down some of the housekeeping rules, you can see those there. Um, so the list of speakers we've got on today's webinar, we've got Matthew Rollins from ABB. We've got Oliver Selby from FANAC. We've got Paul Stout from Adelphi Automations. We've got Michael Buchenemin from uh, Robotic. And we've got Richard Firstfield from CNC Speedwell. Um, now, what I'm going to do to start with is get the guys to introduce themselves, give, give you a, a little bit of an overview of, of, of themselves, their positions and, and what they're going to be bringing to the webinar. So I think what we'll do is we'll start with Matt Rollins from uh, ABB. Over to you, Matt. Thank you, Paul. Uh, well, as you said, Matthew Rollins from ABB. Uh, I've been with ABB a number of years now uh, and uh, I've been, uh, I think, the last five years involved directly with machine tool tending and previous to that I, uh, um, I worked with other machine uh, tool tending businesses as well. Uh, so I've had a number of years working with uh, a lot of companies that are investing in machine tool tending and from people who have been well versed in it to I would probably say the majority have never had machine tools uh, tending before or had robotics before which is where the exciting part is. Uh, so uh, quite a, a vast wide uh, array of experience um, and previous to that I've had different roles from commercial roles to engineering roles to project management roles and uh, uh, and all the rest so yeah it's passing through myself. I expect you've been a busy man over recent uh, years have you with automation really picking up especially after Covid? Yeah absolutely My automation has, uh, has picked up but I think what, what's been really interesting is the number of businesses that never even considered automation prior to uh, three or four years ago are really really starting to take it on board uh, and that's where we've seen the biggest growth I think in general in the industry where people previously didn't have robotic automation or didn't even considered it and I think the, the, the best one I had a uh, story I had from, from uh, only a few months back was someone I visited five years ago who were determined that they would never have automation um, and then uh, literally a couple of months ago, uh, they had the first uh, system installed and they, the question they said is, why did I not do this five years ago? And, uh, did you say, a, did you, did you say I told you so? It all up, really. Did you say I told you so? <laughs> I wanted to, but I refrained. <laughs> uh, thanks. Uh, look forward to your contribution today, Matt. Uh, next up, Oliver Selby from FANUC. Oliver, give us an introduction yeah. to yourself. Thanks, Paul. Yeah, so um, my name's Oliver Selby. I work as a business development manager for FANUC in Coventry um, and I'm primarily joining the call today as kind of a, a robot salesperson but also with some experience in the way in which robots can uh, engage and interact with those CNC controls that um, are so prevalent within the industry. Uh, FANUC having such a high percentage uh, or market share of, of controls on modern day machines 
Um, I'm here to try and provide some insight into uh, the way in which robots can in interface with those older uh, legacy type machines, but also the new machines using current interfaces. Having worked with you, Oliver, I'm sure, I'm sure you're going to have plenty to contribute uh, from not only your own perspective, but from Fanex too. So look forward to uh, you being involved. Uh, Paul Stout from Adelphi Automation. Um, introduce yourself, Paul. Oh, we may have some technical issues, actually. Yeah, we might Paul, have to sorry, it's, it, um, it's Steve Bounce from ABB Robotics. I just thought I'd mention Paul's just having a little bit of technical um tomfoolery with this connection to the meeting. So we're just trying to get that sorted out. But I can give a very brief overview of Paul's experience within the automation market. Um, Paul Stout is the Managing Director of Adelphi Automation, based out of Bradbury in Stockport. And Adelphi have had many years of working with companies of all sizes in many different application fields and many different industries. And one of the ones that they're really focusing on is machine tending to a point where they've actually They've managed to um, produce their own machine tool tending cell, compact cell, that can be used with many machining centers and different companies' machining tool centers. So this is a standard offering from Adelphi, and it gives them a really good automation knowledge of the industry and of the technology that I think is going to have a really good impact on today's conversation. Anyone I think you worked with, Paul there, Steve, with that uh... Overview, very well done. Let's hope that um, let's hope that Paul can be uh, join us soon because I know he's got a lot to contribute to. Uh, Michael Buchemanin from uh, Robotique, uh, if you'd like to introduce yourself. Yes, thanks, Paul. Uh, my name is Michel Beauchemin in French. I'm a French Canadian. Our company is uh, HQ is in uh, Quebec City in Canada. Um, I'm uh, I'm a product manager at Robotique. I'm working there since six years. Uh, Robotic is in the machine tending business since t since day one, so uh, almost more than ten years now. But we were, uh, uh, you know, we're selling our adaptable grippers in that type of uh, application, and uh, you know, at Automate and Automatica, we're going to be launching a new solution, especially for machine tending. So I've been doing a lot of voice of customers since the, the two last years. So I'm going to be. Uh, you know, happy to share my knowledge that I did learn from those ways of customer with you guys. So a lot of hands-on experience working in the field with, with users. Exactly. Yep. Good. That did really deploy good. and and people that did not as well. <laughs> oh, excellent. So both sides of the perspective. Look forward to that then, yep. Michael. Uh, Richard Thirstfield from CNC Speedwell. Uh, great company. Know it well. Um, Richard, introduce yourself. Uh, thanks, Paul. Um, I suppose I'm from the other side of the fence. I'm a user in the best sense of the word. Um, technical and quality director of CNC Speedwell, which is part of the Castings Peace PLC Foundry Group. Um, we've got 120 machining centres, 200 spindles roughly, uh, machining cast iron parts predominantly for the truck people throughout Europe. Uh, we've got currently 16 um, automated lines. Uh, of which those have all been installed over the last 10 years, but we've really sort of accelerated in the last four or five years, I would say, uh, in this area. Okay, that's brilliant. I mean, you, you, you a, a fantastic company. I know we visited a few times and uh, filmed um, some of your plant in action. Productivity at your place is key, isn't it? Um, getting parts through quickly, reliably, accurately. So it'll be good to hear of your experience, Richard. Um, thank you. So that is our, our panel today. Um, just to give you a quick insight into myself, as I mentioned at the start, um, I'm the uh, founder of mtdcnc.com, which is a, a platform where we, we work with companies um, that are on, like on the panel today, as well as many others, uh, promoting UK manufacturing, and, and not just in the UK, but around the world as well. So automation is a topic that is is really close to us as well, and we're seeing it um, when we look at it from, from around the world and compare it to the UK, it's really good to see that we are um, starting to step things up here uh, in these shores. So, um, so yeah, so what we're going to do is we're going to run through, we've got uh, eight questions that we're going to um, tackle or try and tackle over the course of the next half an hour or so. Um, if you do have a question and you're listening or watching, um, please do, uh, yeah, let us know what that question is, but we'll be, we'll be attending to those. Um, at, towards the end of the webinar. Um, so my first question uh, is, where are the best opportunities for return on investment for automated machine tending? Um, looking at potentially three disciplines here, turning, milling, or injection molding, as an example. Um, so I think we'll start actually with Oliver on this one. Um, Oliver, what would you say, where are the best opportunities for return on investment? 
Um, quite simply, it's, uh, it's normally when you've got high throughput of components, components that are uh, able to be fed, um, not only um, during normal work hours, but potentially outside of work hours where you can make use of, say, overnight running or working over a weekend. Um, generally, it, it supports the, the return on investment calculations that you have to do to, to warrant the use of automation. Um, it does rely on a number of different um, circumstances, which is that the parts are or can be handled correctly by automation, that there are uh, no potential quality issues um, that may arise from the machining process, um, and that the parts can be handled and sort of fed into the system, but also uh, taken out of the system and handled in the right way um, using automation. Um, you, can, you can imagine that... Um, over the course of say an overnight shift, you don't want that complete shift's worth of production going into the scrap bin because of one broken cutter or something like that. Typically you have to sort of make allowances um, within the machining cycle, the, pro the, the process itself to ensure that you've got some quality inspection as part of that. I mean, yeah, you're only as good as your weakest link, aren't you? So if you took those three disciplines I mentioned, where, you know, what things can happen that can, can, can affect uh, the return on investment? What are the most difficult, tricky challenges that, that uh, you need to overcome? I think for, for, for me, it's, it's ensuring it's the right product and the right process uh, to start off with. Um, Richard will probably hopefully agree with me there that, that not everything can be automated um, from, from day one. It's kind of you, you want to take your lowest hanging fruit first, ensure that you've got um, the buy-in from your, your stakeholders within the business, um, to get those those future automation projects over the line that may be slightly more difficult, you know. Um, that low-hanging fruit is so important for, for first-time investors in automation. Uh, probably a good uh, time to bring Richard in then. Richard, with your experience on this, um, that return on investment element, I mean, that's, you know, that's something that business is like yours. It, it's crucial. You, you've got to look at it and you've got to get that return on investment as quick as possible. Where would you see the best opportunities? Yeah, definitely. I mean, when load and unload times are critical, um, you put automation in, you can actually manage that better than relying on a person. Um, when component weight, on my side, is an issue, again, health and safety and fatigue come in, um, things like that. And um, as Oliver said, I mean, you really need volume, dedication um, and things like that. Um, yeah, it, it, it's, it really is things like that. A single pallet machine, load and unload is very important. A twin pallet machine, probably slightly less so. Um, but you do need to have consistency of process, consistency of uptimes on machines to support your return and investment on automation. How would you measure that? How would you measure that, Richard? What's your, your method of, of monitor, monitor, uh, monitoring that return? Yeah. We have a, a live system monitoring a Gemba process, um, which reports um, in real time, I think every seven seconds on our machines. And whenever they're down, uh, we put in a reason for, the, for that. And we can see across the whole of our kit, the whole of our shop floor, um, what the uptime is on individual cells, individual machines. Very, very fascinating. I'm sure we'll touch on a few more of those subjects as we move forward. Um, Matthew, uh, from an ABB perspective, uh, wh where do you see the best opportunities for return on investment with automation? Or if you want to just unmute yourself, Matt. That was the phrase of uh, 2000, uh, 2021, <laughs> wasn't it? Anyway, um, yeah, apologies. Um, I think, um, as, as Richard said, I think uh, where anywhere where you can um, reduce that load and unload time and, and you take the drumbeat away from the operator to the machine uh, and, and that gives you increased efficiency. I think Oliver mentioned um, working additional shifts. And I think that's where some of the smaller companies that we've worked with have really, really seen uh, benefits where, where you're working two shifts and a five-day uh, five working week. Uh, all of a sudden, uh, you can stock up your, your automation and every night you get any extra, an extra however many parts that you can run through uh, the automation system. And again, um, in, in potentially into a weekend, 
and you're getting that for free. So you're getting all of that, that, that productivity. Higher value parts, quite often um, the payback is easier. Um, where you've got higher value machines. So if you've got a, ultimately the higher the value of the machine tool, you're, if you're increasing the efficiency of that machine tool, the percentage value is easier uh, to justify. So again, payback works um, works better. But one of the things that I think I think has been mentioned a couple of times by both Oliver and Richard is uh, the low hanging fruit and, and, and those e easier to automate uh, systems. All too often, we see customers trying to jump in and getting excited by automation, which is great, but sometimes going a little bit too far. Lathes and turning is a great place to start if you've got those kind of uh, opportunities because simple unload uh, and load, everything's on a center, uh, central spindle and that seems to work really, really well. And it gets by it to get a good successful starting project and um, gets everybody within the business um, used to automation and a positive approach to automation and everything else just becomes so much easier as you go on your automation journey. I think that's the key. Automation is a journey, it's not a destination. Yeah, I mean, turning is an interesting one because often people talk about automation and they talk about bar feeds and they don't realise that, that they think automation is different to a bar feed, but a, a bar feed is essentially the first step in a process, isn't it, of automation and machine tending. Um, thanks, Matt. I, I want to come on to Michael now because I know he's got experience, uh, you know, hands on in the field, as he said, with both the users and being a supplier. Um, Michael, in your opinion, best opportunities for return on investment when it comes to machine tending? Um, I think there's a lot of things that have been said that everybody was true on that. I, I, I turn to look at the question on, is it going to be easier in terms of deploying on a milling machine or a turning or a lathe or an injection molding? And what's the effect on the ROI? And I would say, I, I do agree with the with Matthew on that one, the lathe and turning are definitely the easiest one just because of the, uh, you know, the work holding is part of the machine as well. So it's always placed at the same, you know, you're putting the, 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 the place at, at the same location. So it's easier to program and everything like that versus a milling machine, for example, that could have multiple device location on a table. Um, you know, you're talking in milling machine, we're talking about the three axis, four axis, five axis, which it, it's it's the geometry of the parts that uh, that is driving a little bit the discussion on that. So, with all those features uh, and and I think that um, you know just the cost of the work holding that needs to be automated as well on a on a vice versus a turning machine. I would say that the milling uh, turning machine and late are the easiest one. So the the ROI would be easier as well. I've seen a lot of uh, customers that. Uh, Yes, they want to gain in production at night, but uh, they already have, uh, you know, we're in the labor uh, shortage era, so they already have uh, issues uh, fulfilling the evening shift, for example. So uh, I've seen a lot of places where they're uh, using the operator during the day shift before going for the night shift. They're, they're not gaining the whole eight hours. They're going to gain four hours, for example, in terms of autonomy, but it's still uh, have a good ROI because they don't have operators. So that, I would say, that's my summary, but um, turning yeah. late is definitely the, the first one to start with. Yeah, I mean, turning turning uh, nowadays, the, the, the advancements in the machines means often turning machines mill as well, don't they? Which, again, is kind of automating processes, one hit machine, and adding additional automation to that. It's, um, it's interesting to get your opinions on that. Yeah, turning seems to be uh, possibly maybe the answer there now if you do have a question relating to either this question or the question we just asked or any of the questions that are up and coming we will be answering them towards the end of the webinar so uh, question number two what are the biggest challenges that need to be considered when considering automate, uh, automated machine tending and i suppose probably with this one guys but probably maybe possibly look to lean on you to maybe give us an experience or some a challenge that you faced specifically um where yeah, where it's been a really big challenge. And in fact, let's start with you, Michael, uh, finishing the last question. We'll uh, bring you in for question two. Yeah, like I was saying, uh, I guess shop owners, they, they are in the labor shortage uh, era as well, like I was saying. Uh, they, they, they know that they need to automate. Uh, they, they're, keep, you know, they're keeping to hire people, but uh, you know, it's a little bit more complex. And uh, 
must uh, must also say that the, the youth are are do not want to work in environment and, and repetitive tasks as well. So they, they look at it and they see automation as complex and expensive. Uh, but I think that the first challenge that bring complexity and also additional costs would be the communication between the uh, the CNC, uh, the robot and the CNC. Uh, there's uh, there's not one solution that fit all. Uh, as of now, it's mostly always custom from one brand to another one. Uh, from even in the same brand, they, they change protocol and everything. So I would say that the, uh, the the main blocker number one or the challenger number one would be the communication. And that's that's an aspect of complexity as well. Uh, and I guess that's the that's why it's the uh, because of all the variables. I think it's the that's why it's the biggest challenge. Interesting. My um, Richard, as as uh, a company that's obviously faced, I'm sure, many challenges, uh, every business does. What would be something from your experience that you would say um, would be some of the biggest challenges when considering your automation machine technology? Yeah. Um, I'd take on board Michael's point there of communication. Uh, that's something we've learned um, a little bit the hard way, and we've actually simplified that and tried to dumb it down a little bit with more just simple inputs and outputs rather than going through the profinet time kind of route where everything knows what everything else is doing. And we've actually found it's easier to simplify and almost um, rely on the logic and the fact that you're asking it to do something more like a metal man. So that's how we've approached that side of it. The other, the other biggest challenges we've found is the fixturing. And we do a lot of different components, a lot, a lot of different castings. And you have to be a little bit careful on what type of fixtures work well, um, what type of parts work well, um, that, you, that are consistent, um, and almost how many parts you're trying to move as well within a cycle. Because robots tend to have one arm, they might have two grippers. Um, when compared to an operator who has two hands and could do two different things with them, um, sometimes you've got to take a step back and, and look at the number of part movements and the complexity that you're trying to do within a certain machining time, because we run a lot of twin pallet machines, to make sure that the robot can keep up with what you're trying to achieve. Uh, what about question for you as well, Richard, on, on the material types, because you're machining a lot of cast, cast iron or castings. Um, you, you've got to factor this into to machining processes, what you're creating as your, you know, dust uh, within the environment of the machining process. You've got to control that as well, haven't you? Very much so. Um, you've got to be mindful of swarf traps. You've got to make sure your pallet washes are good so that the majority of the loose swarf is removed from the fixture before you unload the parts. And then you've got to use a, a you've got to be, get better at your air blasting on the robot to make sure you're not loading back onto Swarth. Um, so yeah, that all these things um, need to be factored in. Some of them can only be learnt on the job and developed um, when you've got the job. And it, it is, you sort of evolve with a product and you learn which products work better and which products are more problematic, I would say. Uh, Oliver, from a FANUC perspective, uh, delivering solutions continuously in, in these areas, you, you must see as many challenges as well. Every solution comes from solving a challenge, doesn't it? So what have you seen? Yeah, you? absolutely, Paul. So, I mean, typically customers, the first challenge we have is when customers come to us saying, uh, we want to load these parts into a um, into a machine. Um, and, and how are they presented? They're presented in a bin from their, their casting foundry or whatever. And they say, well, can you pick them from that bin? And um, that's always a challenge. The first question I'll ask is, can you do some bin picking? And, and obviously that is a... A, a very complex task in itself. Um, so, so the first thing we try and do is try and find a way in which we can actually sort of work back in the supply chain to ensure that parts are presented in the right way in an easy way to actually automate. And that goes alongside um, sort of discussions we have in all sorts of industries. It's not just machine loading. You look across um, assembly, um, food. It's always a case of making sure the parts, once they're in some sort of order, you can automate them. Um, we always have this discussion right up front with customers in that once you've got control of it or whether you can control your supply chain to put the parts that you want to load into a tray or onto a, a, a conveyor or pallet or whatever it may be, and once you've got control of it, don't lose that. So, so parts from foundries, as Richard will know, are, are notoriously difficult to load straight from the bin. 
<laughs> Absolutely, I can, I can imagine. And uh, Matt, uh, before we move on to the next question, and um, uh, uh, question three, that communication has been mentioned um, first off uh, by Michael. How do you see the communication elements being solved and the challenges in that area? And in fact, what could ABB do to, to uh, give people confidence that communications, if there is an issue, it's easily solved or, you know, um, it's actually not that big a problem? I think what, what Richard said is, is absolutely uh, key. Uh, I think simplicity, um, don't try and overcomplicate it. Uh, I think sometimes people search uh, for too, uh, to complicate too many things. I mean, we, we often see in the automotive world um, where there are covered in sensors, covered in, 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 in check uh, devices. And the reality is that when you look through a lot of, uh, of the failures um, and the stoppages, it, it's not the the actual thing that's broken, it's the thing that's checking the thing that's broken. So again, keeping it simple, I think often um, uh, has a lot of advantages. Good stuff. Okay, right, on to the next question. What other equipment is required in addition to a robot? Because we all know it's not, it's not, just, it's not just the robot. Um, Oliver, from a, a FANUC perspective, uh, perhaps you could give us an insight into what other equipment is needed. Yeah, so, so typically with a, an automation system, you end up with um, a feed solution, as I mentioned before, whether that's a, a pallet, stillage, or location for, for those, a conveyor solution. Um, potentially, you may have looked look at a vision system. Uh, if you haven't got control of the parts at that point, you may need uh, an end of arm tool that I'm sure um, Michael can, can help us with. Um, and then it's a case of obviously understanding how you're going to open the door if there's no, no automatic door. Um, it really is a case that you need um, a control system, uh, some sort of quality check potentially, uh, and a way to outfeed those parts because you may not want to put those parts that have been machined back in the same transport or, or, or tray as they came in. Um, obviously, there are, there are instances where you need to maintain surface finish, um, uh, tolerancing uh, and you may want to obviously feed them into another process beyond that machining process whether that be a wash uh, further quality checks or an assembly process well let's bring michael in at this point then what what, what would you say uh, michael from your experience are the additions that people really do need to consider with with robots and you see most well definitely you know uh, i think grippers that are properly fitting the, the geometry and the size of the part that would be uh, required. Okay, so that's that's also something. I think the work holding, like uh, Richard was mentioning, it's a second uh, after communication. What I've seen is, okay, well, especially on a milling machine, I do have manual vice. Now I need to automate those vice. So there's a couple of solutions on the market, but at some point there's, a, there's one, um, you know, as, has been an issue, you need to automate and so get rid of your manual to put elsewhere in your shop, but you will need to uh, to have work holdings to, to clamp the parts that needs to be automated. Uh, those tend to be uh, kind of expensive, but still, uh, one of the things that did uh, raise up was the uh, the cycle time, uh, not the cycle time, the lead time for those devices that I, I've seen uh, increase. Of course, like everything in the you know, this uh, last six months, everything is taking long longer. There's less uh, component and everything. So that's something that uh, uh, is uh, is important to consider. The second one is also the, the feeding system. Uh, I think if, especially if you've got a high mix, low volume uh, type of part production, uh, you will need to adapt. So the, f the feeding will need to adapt to your geometry as well and also to your uh, uh, quantity of parts. So that's going to be uh, another things to consider as well. Um, Richard, was, was there anything at CNC Speedwell that you needed to add to the, the automation and the robots and the machine tending from your perspective that surprised you or you thought you may not need? Um, not that really surprised me, I don't think. I think the Deber is always a challenge. Um, I've always tried to get a part coming out of an automated cell which can almost go straight in the box, just needs looking at. Um, Tell so, us about that. Tell us about that, Deba. How, how do you how do you do that? I mean, I'm intrigued. You 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 can use various. There are various different ways. I don't say we found the answer. You can use sort of grinding um, type tools. You can use brushes. There are quite a lot of impregnated brushes on the market. And as long as you can maintain a certain level of burr, 
uh, which can be a challenge as well while machining, um, you just need to be able to flick it off um, consistently. Um, I'm not saying we've got it perfect in everyone and you do have to keep working on that. It's always been an open dialogue between myself and the um, automation provider to say, I understand that's a challenge. I, I can't ho really hold your feet to the flames. We don't quite get it right first time, but we can always work on it. Um, and we probably can, we continue to work on that. And then the other things you add on beyond that are things like wash, pressure test, assembly potentially, if you have this very sim simple things like that, I'm, I'm always up for the challenge of trying to get all those things in so you don't have to do anything else with the part when it comes out other than look at it. Yeah, the utopia. Um, great stuff, I'm gonna move on to question four now, um, vision systems. Uh, Matt, we'll, we'll bring you in on this. What experience have you got with vision systems uh, when it comes to machine tending? Because I would imagine these days it's it's becoming ever more required, isn't it, or a, a, a benefit? It is, and I think uh, we, we touched on it before. But the the, uh, the easy bit is is from the robot into the machine. The difficult bit is how do we get it from that spillage that uh, into the uh, um, uh, to the end of the robot arm. Um, one of the key things that I mean, all of our standards or the ABB standard um, solutions for machine tending are based around vision um, because of the flexibility that we see a lot of customers wanting. Uh, I think, I mean, I know we, you know we mentioned and touched on 3D vision systems and bin picking and everybody seems to want a bin picking solution. And um, there are lots of solutions um, and ABB has, has some solutions, but they're not right for all applications. And I think it's important to consider your components. The limitation with most vision systems is not the vision system itself or the bin, bin picking solution. The limitation is in the actual grippers. I think uh, uh, Michelle will have uh, something to say about this. It's the fact that there are physical limitations. If you, if you can reach into a pallet with your eyes closed and, pick, and feel and pick a part up, you can probably do it with a 3D vision system. If you have to grab a part, shake it around, pull another part away to try and pull it out, you won't be able to pick it out of, out of a pallet. Then you also have to consider what is the value? Because if you can have a flat conveyor, which is how a systems work, so a flat conveyor, load a conveyor up, and how long does that take? You, you may be able to get two or three hours automation for the sake of five minutes uh, operator loading. So if you've got fairly light components, then um, a 2D system and a, and a belt fed system is probably a more effective or cost effective way of doing it. Where I think 3D pallet picking systems or bin picking solutions work quite well is if you have components that are roughly um, orientated, so they're not uh, it could be slightly angled, it could be slightly, slightly different uh, the orientations, but there's a generally a rough orientation to them. And they're quite large, heavy components, so you've got manual handling. So that, again, gives you some added advantage. You get the added advantage of removing the manual handling and, and the potential um, risk of injury. You, it takes longer to handle large components, so there's a, a, a time saving, and you don't want to be doubly handling those kind of components. So, and they tend to be in a pallet and they tend to sit uh, in a way that you can access them reasonably well. So, so that's something that I think uh, works well. I would imagine talking about this topic of, of, of vision, Richard, you, with your castings, do, do you incorporate this in your business into your automation? Oh yes, um, yeah, we do. Um, mostly 2D, but there is a couple, a couple of applications where um, ABB have come in with the 3D where we actually pick larger parts out of boxes. Um, so we've got experience of both of those. Um, the Tell us the good bits and the bad bits about it. But, you know. The, 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 the 3D picking out of boxes is a challenge. If your parts are too close to the wall and the gripper can't actually get in, it'll stop. You have to move the parts. If you use rust preventive packaging in there, it affects the, the um, vision system. You've got to think about all these kind of things. You need to have a level of control on how the parts are presented into the cell. Otherwise, um, it does have constraints. Um, so you've got to be a little bit careful on what you choose to do it on. The 2D, putting the parts onto a belt, as Matt says, works pretty well. Um, and 
there's a good flexible solution for that. If you have different products you want to put through a line, it, it, it works nicely, um, provided you, you spec your conveyor to the correct size for the components you're going to machine, which is usually governed by the size of the machining envelope. Okay, great. Now we're going to move on to, in fact, I do need to set this point. Uh, in about 10 minutes time, we're going to enter into our Q&A. So we've got quite a bit to get through before then. So if you have got questions for the panel, we've got them coming in um, as, as we speak, but this is your opportunity to, um, to ask the panel. That'll be coming up in about 10 minutes time. Um, Oliver, you've probably got some comments you want to add to uh, Vision. So we can do that at the same time as asking you uh, about interface types as well. Um, traditional machine tools versus molding machines, for example. What's the differences with the interface? Maybe give us a quick overview on Vision yourself and then talk to us about the interfaces. Yeah, I think with, with, with Richard and, uh, and Matthew's uh, comments, we've pretty much covered Vision um, fairly well. Um, Again, one of the things we, we speak about when we talk about vision systems is the lighting. That is always paramount about how you actually light a, a vision solution to ensure that you get the best reliable um, conditions, be it morning, noon or night. You know, it's, um, it needs, needs controlling fairly well. Um, the other thing to say uh, regarding the vision is that um, it would always be uh, preferential from a, a robot supplier's point of view and, and also from an integrator's point of view that you ask them to do trials on the parts before you commit to a solution using a vision system. Uh, and they should be willing to do that for you. Um, on the interface side, um, things have changed dramatically over the last yeah, 15, 10, five years, you know, um, from, a, from an interface point of view, more and more interface or field bus communication methods have come on the market um, that interface directly with different control types uh, or through gateways as we call them. Um, but typically, they, they revolve around a, uh, an Ethernet cable from uh, in some form going from one machine through a switch into a PLC or a control directly. Um, where you see a difference is actually on the uh, injection molding side. Um, and um, interestingly, the injection molding sort of side of the business that we, we deal with have actually had European kind of a standard configuration for interface for the, for the last 10 or 15, 20 years, which um, allowed them to um, find a, that, that common solution, allowed them to sort of um, commonize across the industry or from a machine point of view with an interface that they know will work with automation. It's called Euromap um, and it comes in different guises. You have Euromap 67, which is for just general machine, uh, sort of injection molding uh, interface, Euromap 73, um, a different interface for the safety should you want the doors open while you're machine tending your, your injection molding machine. So these standard interfaces are something that I believe um, if, if we can find a way from a machine tool point of view to, 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 uh, to commonize would be a great way forward that globally would support the, the, uh, the introduction of more and more automation on machine loading solutions. Um, but I don't know how far and who you'd go to to start start, start talking about that. Um, what about yourself, Matt, being a supplier um, of, of the uh, machine tending solutions, the interfacing element that, that Oliver mentioned there? What's your experience of it, and, and do you agree with it? I think I think having a standard uh, solution would be a great idea. Um, I think the, the, the challenge that we have with a lot of the machines is obviously a lot of the machines will automate the legacy machines and, and it's that it's, it's finding a simple solution to do that but I think using um, I mean, most of the systems that we use even the really simple ones we still use a an ethernet connection um, some sort of uh, bus connection uh, so it means that if you need to change anything if you need to move uh, anything it's a simple plug and unplug um, so that, that that keeps it again uh, keeps it simple and you can configure a lot, a lot of the, the, the software offline. Okay, great. Well, we, we are slowly getting, well, well, quickly getting towards uh, running out of time. So I'm going to move on to another point here. I want to bring Michael in with his experience. We talked about return on investment um, at the start of this webinar. Um, I want to try and maybe dig into the real, real detail. Often people will evaluate their return on investment on just simply one piece of hardware, a robot loading and unloading machine. Are there other areas that they should factor in to this return on investment? And what have you seen, Mike? What would they be? 
Uh, one of the, the thing I've seen is uh, people tend to look at their return on investment at the time of the install, but uh, in the reality of the IMIX low volume, uh, at some point they need to add new program, new trajectory for the robot for new part uh, every time that they're introducing uh, a new part to their production. So th this is also you know, the important to calculate if you're saving time and programming the robots and everything when you're doing changeovers or new part introduction, that's going to affect the ROI as well. Um, I guess one of the other thing is, uh, I mean, using a robot at some point, if the program is good, it means less error, human error as well. So better quality at some point, less accident at some point, some, some, some parts are uh, really sharp and th that's going to have an effect as well that are a little bit outside of the return on investment, but that do are that are uh, some factors that needs to be considered as well. Um, the, the fact is, if you have a robot doing the loading and unloading, a human being will still be required to to monitor the robot or to to, to teach the robot to do new actions as well. But the the the, the workers will uh, you know will focus on more added value tasks such as quality control. So that would have another impact as well on the return on investment because it's uh, it's it's an increase of value there as well. So that being said, those are always have uh, factors on the return on investment as well and needs to be considered. Uh, Richard, you, you've, you've obviously hands-on experience in this area. Are there areas that you would now doing this exercise again factor into your return on investment that you didn't before as part of the machine tendy um, solution? I think sometimes you overestimate um, the labour savings. You've got to be careful of that. Um, you think we've gone from one 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 operator on one machine, if you like, to trying to do one operator five machines, and it's too much. And we've settled it between three and a half and four at best. Um, you need to make sure they're not having to do anything else when the parts come out, or else then you increase your labour load again, which doesn't give you the sums you want. I think. As you introduce it, you work out what works best and you get better at your forecasting. And I think- Anything that surprised you? Um, anything surprised me? Lots of things, but probably nothing I can talk about particularly here. Um, it, it, it's all about how good you, how consistent you can get the parts coming out, out, of the, um, out, out, out of the cell. The one thing that probably surprised me most was People tend to think just because it comes out of an automated cell, it must be correct. And you do have to get over that fact that the assumption that the robot always does it right, it's only as good as everything else. So you need to drill into people who are still running these cells that robots aren't perfect. Um, you put rubbish in, you get rubbish out, whether it's from the machine, the tooling, the fixturing, or the raw product. Um, and you actually need to look at things a bit more because you only have one shot. If you're picking it off the belt and putting it in a box, rather than handling it for deburring, which you in traditionally would have done. That's probably my biggest warning on automation. Okay, uh, Oliver, from a, from a supplier, anything that uh, you picked up in, in recent uh, years that you thought, wow, that is an area people really need to focus on? Yeah, Include. I mean, you mentioned most of them, but where we can add or have value add activities beyond the, 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 the part coming out of the machine, like Richard mentioned, deburring, quality checks, um, ensuring that the, the part is in its best possible state going forward from that operation um, should be factored into the ROI, but it's always very difficult to calculate and, and sometimes is missed. You know, just the, the increase in quality or the increase in bad parts going out the door, sorry, the decrease in bad parts going out the door, we should say, um, should, should be factored in, but it's not always easy to calculate out. So uh, that's all I would add. Okay, I'm going to ask you a question uh, now to, to all, all you guys. Um, uh, gantry or overhead type systems? I've seen both of these. Matt, let's start with you. Um, I know it's it's all application specific, as we say at MTD. But what would you say your opinion in those areas are? They have their place. Um, I think uh, in a lot of uh, a lot of situations, people forget that gantries and um, tracks can be quite expensive. So I'd always uh, caution, um, if you're considering a gantry, why do you need a gantry um, or, 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 a, or a track? Because if you're adding 
a track, sometimes you can add a second robot for not much more and get the value of, 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 that, uh, of that system. Where gantries and tracks are very, very useful are when you have very, very long cycle times um, and you need to access um, a multiple machines that may be attending once every couple of hours and, and, and you see that sort of in automotive, it's really in, in, in aerospace for those kinds of environments. Okay, Oliver, from your side of things at FAMIC, and, and maybe just give a very quick description of what the two different the differences are for those that don't know. Yeah, so, um, so typically what we've seen um, from our point of view is that you do generally have customers ask for robots to do the machine loading. Um, and you can have a robot on a track or, or an overhead uh, rail to support uh, the, the load unload of multiple machines. Um, I think the, the question probably revolves around the use of a, a track in its own right without a robot, maybe whether it's two axis, three axis or more to support the loading of machine tools from above or the side um, where they allow. Now, uh, most recent application we've had is where you've had a company with a number of old legacy machines, very, very large parts that were probably even too big for a robot to, to pick up. But we actually managed to supply a control system from FANAC to actually control the, the gantry and make it a CNC controlled gantry solution. Um, this, is, this is kind of a little bit different. It's a little bit out there. But what it allowed for was an automated solution on legacy machines with quite out, outdated controls um, with automation whilst um, still allowing access to the machines for setting. Um, because a, a gantry from overhead still allows you access generally to get to the front of the machine with a person to ensure that the setting can be done correctly. Um, once it's running, you start the automation to start loading and transferring parts from one op to the next. Um, that's our experience at the moment. Uh, we're lucky enough to have a control system that allows it. Um, yeah, so we, we, we'll probably see more and more of those solutions come about as more and more companies start to automate, and especially those that have got bigger parts or legacy machines that they can't really move or whether where the foundations of those machines have been put in place years and years ago, you know, and, and it's very, very expensive to move machines. Um, so that's sort of, sort of our experience. Okay, I do need to apologize at this point as well, but I believe my camera uh, seems to have stopped working. I'm not sure if it is working great. If it's not, it's probably not too much of a bad thing. Question and answer coming up right after this one. So if you have got questions for the panel, please get them um, into us now. Finally, um, cobots, uh, AGVs, automatic guided vehicles. Uh, Michael, have you had any experience of these? And um, what's your opinion about that when it comes to um, tending the machine? Definitely. Um, well, Robotic is has a strong market share on cobot. So that's why I've been involved with more cobot deployment than industrial robot. Uh, so what I see, and every time I, uh, I, I see in machine shop owners and I did interview with them, they say, well, I'm going to buy a robot and I'm going to move the robot from one CNC to another one. Uh, it's a good concept. Uh, one of the blockers to that would be the communication, of course, of those machines because uh, it's, well, maybe uh, maybe Richard has a different opinion, but uh, some, most of the time it's not always the same machine that you've got and the same uh, brands and same types of machine next to each other. So communication is a blocker as well. Uh, it, let's say we remove the communication. Uh, there's going to be the, the position of the robot or the position of the part presentation where it needs always to be sitting at the same place. Uh, so that that's an, a, another challenge. But uh, definitely Cobot for machine tending, I've seen that more and more. I think that uh, during the last year, uh, people that did uh, deploy some Cobot in machine tending were uh, more innovators. Now they were, were about to enter the mass production, I guess, for those uh, as uh, they the labor shortage continue to grow. So I think that's uh, that's something we're gonna see change more and more. Okay, that's uh, good. And then uh, Matt, from yourself, uh, cobots and ADVs and stuff like that. Yeah, from a cobot side of things, uh, it, it's, cobots have their place. And I think uh, there's some great advancements with uh, with cobots uh, from, from everyone. And um, the challenge I, I, I have is that um, why do we put uh, a cobot in uh, a machine tool environment? Uh, the main reasons that you use cobot is because you're working collaboratively with a human. Uh, so because of that, cobots have limitations. They are slower and generally not as durable or, or not, not suited to harsher environments that you might find in, in machine tool tending. 
So you end up with slower cycle times and a potentially um, not as well protected um, uh, arm uh, as, as you would a more traditional ro um, robot. And you don't really need the uh, interactivity because you can still get the easy access into uh, um, a cell using the traditional robot and some uh, more advanced um, safety functions that I know a lot of um, the robot manufacturers, ourselves included, uh, offer. So you can get the best of both worlds. I think uh, people are attracted to the whole cobot thing because of the ease of programming. But again, you can get that with traditional ro robots, with things like Wizard Easy programming and things like that, that, are, that a lot of people like ABB and the other uh, robot brands uh, um, offer. So the, the, the cobot solutions, yes, they have their place. My question is, are they right in, in machine tending? Um, it's an easy step into it, but there are potentially better better options, is, is my uh, opinion. Um, AGVs massively increasing, um, uh, and I think there are there are advantages uh, to moving uh, components about and removing some of that work in progress uh, that we see uh, a lot in in, in factories. Okay, uh, Oliver, anything to add to that before we move into the Q&A, which we literally only got five minutes for. So we're going to uh, any questions that we don't get answered in that Q&A will be available um, to be seen. Uh, I'll tell you exactly where you can see those before we conclude. But, uh, Oliver, anything to add? No, no, just a general comment about Cobot, sort of uh, what, what you uh, what you, the general perception from the market or from the uh, from social media is that they, they're like a is the buzzword a cobot will allow you to do anything with a robot yeah and, and it's not the case um, as matthew said it's it's very much driven around um the ease of use um the fact that you can work next to a person without offense these are all misconceptions it all comes down to the risk assessment and i think we've probably got a question there in the chat about the way in which you risk assess um cobot applications for certainly machine loading it's the same as um, as any other risk assessment that you would actually have to do to UK CA mark or C mark solution, albeit you now also have the added uh, responsibility to CE mark against um, the hazards of actually hitting a person working in uh, collaborative mode um, next to the robot. Um, robots work a lot slower when you start to look at the actual forces that they can apply, even in cobot mode. Um, and certainly when you start looking at the actual applications, you generally get to a point where I don't want to be moving this lump of metal that may weigh five, six, seven kilos around um, with the sharp edges around a person's head. And typically all our machine tools are built where you would have to work around someone's head height to actually manipulate components into them. So you get to a point where you, you go through the, the measures to actually risk assess and you find out that actually it's it's not really worth it. And, and as Matthew says there, there are other solutions in the market using industrial robots and their, um, their associated safety functions um, that work a lot better, work a lot quicker, and are a lot safer. And that's really sort of where, where I would be coming okay. from there. Um, Oliver, quick question for you on the Q&A here. Remember, any of these questions that don't get answered, they will be available or they will be answered on the website after this. Uh, I'm looking to automate welding paint spraying for big fabrication in Aluminium, are there any tested robots that will do this, uh, Oliver? From Fanic, that's from Vita, uh, Ron yeah, yes, yes, there are, and I would say you can get in touch with any of the major robot manufacturers to uh, to find out what their um, their uh, their uh, offer is. I think most of the major manufacturers do specific painting robots for um, those particular high risk application areas. Okay, thank you. Um, other than cost of implementation, what are the main reasons behind businesses uh, having not going ahead with automation? Uh, I think this is a, probably a good one for Matt, really. Wh why would you had that example you gave earlier on where someone five years ago said they didn't want to automate and then now they've ended up doing it? Is it just reticence and anxiousness as they're not doing the right thing, but really they should be doing it? I think a lot of it's um, uh, hesitancy, um, their fear of the unknown. I think there's, I, think there's, I noticed a couple of comments in the chat about um, uh, the fear of how it will be perceived with their, with their current workforce. Will people 
think that it's taking their jobs. And I think this is a really interesting topic that we haven't got time for today. Um, but th there's, there's a misconception that robots are taking people's jobs. Um, all of the places that we put robots in, ultimately it's to grow the business, which ultimately leads in, in more uh, people because it creates further jobs down the line. So I think this is something that's, uh, that, 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 that uh, yeah, that, that needs to be addressed. Um, and I think it, there's a lot of hesitancy um, and the fear of the unknown, but that ultimately gets, uh, yeah, yeah, the first step, um, taking the first step, choosing the right the right project um, takes away a lot of that fear. Okay, a question for Richard from Julian Ware. What is a typical uh, return on investment for a, sing a simple machine tool tending application? And did Richard get the return on investment they hoped for or even better? I would suggest having so many spindles running, the answer to that is probably yes, you did. But yeah, I'll let you... I mean, we're looking for a, th a three year return on investment is our benchmark. Uh, we will flex that a little bit depending on other factors, health and safety and the like. Um, or quality, um, but we're, we're not a million miles away um, from the ones I've been involved with um, over the last five or six years. Okay, that's a good answer. Uh, what challenges are there in automating CNC milling with high mix, low volume productions? Uh, Michael, perhaps you can have your say on this, what you've seen. How have these challenges been overcome if they are? So that's a high mix, low volume production. I think it's one of the thing is uh, the, the Programming of those uh, different type of, uh, uh, of, you know, our high variety of parts and everything like that. Uh, so if, if you're uh, just copy and pasting and changing some value in one, because it's just uh, some diameters that are changing, that's, that's awesome. But in the reality of iMix low volume geometry will tend to be very, very different. So every time if you're, uh, one of the challenges is gonna be uh, the, the complexity of programming the robot. Uh, the other one would be uh, on the milling machine, definitely, like I was uh, saying a little bit earlier, the work holding that needs to be uh, that that needs to be automated. So the fixturing and everything, depending on all the geometries and size of parts as well, will be a challenge for uh, for iMix low volume. Uh, I've got to say, we really have, uh, we could carry on for another half an hour or so, probably more, I would say, but we have got to wrap this up now. Um, I would totally agree with your comments. Circle. I think um, I think uh, low volume, high mix is something we're seeing at MTD CNC so frequently now um, adopting automation um, and, you know, with pretty quick return on investments as well. So don't, don't be nervous about um, investing in automation if you are practicing that type of manufacturing. Um, now, it leads me to say that um, all these questions and our questions that we've had will be available on the website over the next week uh, and the survey that will pop up. Will be a survey that pops up when the session ends. Um, if you could uh, participate in that, that would be much appreciated. Uh, now, don't forget the PPMA, um, the largest show, uh, the PPMA total show uh, 2022 runs from 27th to the 29th of September. Uh, and that's all about um, promoting uh, processing, packaging, vision systems, automation, the whole um, the whole shooting match, and you can see more detail on that by visiting the PPMA website, uh, ppmashow.co.uk. That just leaves me to thank the panellists today, uh, Matt Rollins from ABB, Oliver Selby from FANAC. Unfortunately, Paul Stout did, uh, couldn't join us in the end, I'm sure um, his details will be available if you do want to speak to him in due course. Michael Buchenemin and uh, from Robotti and Richard Thursfield from CNC Speedwell. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for your time. Um, it's been a, a great uh, roundtable webinar. I hope those um, listening have enjoyed it. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Guys.